Straw Hut Media. It was good to see you the other week, man. It, it has been too long. We can't do that anymore. We got to stop that. It was very good. It was good for my soul, man. It revitalized me. Yeah. You know, it was nice to hear from you. People always say they're going to stay in touch, and nobody ever does. And then, you know, even though it was a long time, it was worth it. It really was. <laughs> you know, I was happy to see you. I, I was a different person in a way, you know, for the rest of that day than I was when I got there. Ah. You know, because you did that, you reached out for me. So yeah, um, things. A couple of the things we talked about got a little bit better, actually. Good. I'm Based glad. On your advice. <laughs> yeah, but I'm glad. I'm yeah, glad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But see, see, like I was telling you, the law of receiving is to give, and then don't expect equal measure because once you give, you're going to get back way more than you gave. That's just the way the universe flows. No, I, I, I'm, I'm hit by, I, uh, I told you I'm, that I'm doing the uh, uh, group chats at the rehab thing. Yes, you did. And, uh, you know, that I started doing it again uh, from, because I gave up on it. Right. But, you know, after seeing you and, and, and thinking about a lot of things, I, I, I went back and I started again. And, uh, and you're, you're right. You get a lot more back than you than you thought than you think, or right. you, and I th that's what I missed about it. You know, yeah. yeah. In the beginning, it was all like, "Hey, guess what? You know, I'm I'm sober, and you're not, and and here's why you're not." You know, and then I realized, why well, there's a whole other thing there. That's yeah, yeah. Well, how about the fact that I'm worried about people that's trying to get there, and 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 here's what I did right to to, to get there. That right. was really a uh, I didn't expect it to, to have that uh, notion of it. Man, there was a couple people sitting in there uh, the other night. Uh, this one cat, he's from the NFL. Okay. You know, and I recognized him from some uh, ESPN. Yeah, I don't need and to know his name or anything. No, no, I'm not yeah, even yeah, going to okay. say that. All right, good. No, I'm not going to say that. Yeah. But there he was, and I, Jesus, you know, he needs advice from me. <laughs> oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. You know, it, it was like... Uh, it's a big privilege, you know. Well, you, I don't know if you see it like I see it, but you're an asset, brother. Um, you have helped a lot of people. None of us oh. are perfect. I ain't talking about that. Stop thinking about the, the, the mistakes and the flaws in all of our fabric because we're all cut from the same cloth and some of us tear holes in our own fabric and jack it up and you just got to fix it by extending yourself to other people. You've been doing that from the beginning. I don't know if you know it, but you have. No, I, I wouldn't know it. I mean, I, I had no idea of that. I, I, I was so into my own self there for so many years, man. I mean, you know, and I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not even saying bad thing about that. Sometimes you got to be into yourself, man. I mean, you know, who the fuck else is going to care about you sometimes? I mean, geez, you get a little selfish. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think anything wrong about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's about balance anyway. You know, yeah. um, in order for us to work as an actor, we got to believe that we have some value. You seem to have found that about yourself, you know. Yeah, but but you found it about yourself, too. There would be no Michael Madsen for the rest of the world to enjoy if you didn't first believe. So, no, that makes that's the way it goes. The thing is to find balance, not allow that to pressure us so much that when we're not on stage doing what we do that we start falling into despair because we think what we do is who we are. All I remember really was that I wanted to prove everybody wrong mm. who told me, you know, when I was 15, you're nothing, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're nothing but a bum and yeah. you ain't gonna make it, Michael Madsen, man. Oh, you you high motherfucker. You, mm. you, you, you burglarizing bastard, you know, you thieving, you know, you fuck you, man. And, and I, I was like, hey, no, man, God, I, I got something to give, and I, I, I'm going to prove everybody wrong, and you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do this movie. I'm going to play a baseball player because, because I never played baseball in school, right? You know, and they're going to be so surprised to see me smack that baseball, and he, well, he never did that when we knew him, you know, and and, and it was a self. <laughs> 
serving thing, you know, because I, I actually, I did a, the natural baseball movie. That's why I brought it up. But a friend of mine from high school, many years ago when that happened, he got in touch with me where somebody asked him a question. Did you see Michael in the natural? And he said, well, <laughs> he didn't make the team I was on. <laughs> oh. You know, because he was the big, right. the big jock in school, right? And, and yeah. uh, but I guess once you get a little bit of that self uh, aggrandizement, it kind of wears off, right? Yeah, yeah. It becomes more about you actually know you have something to offer, right? Yeah, but there's as there's as much difference between being self serving as self preserving. It's like that's what that is. Anytime the enemy comes along and motivates us to get into a fight to prove them wrong, and people oppose you, that's self preserving because the winner inside us won't allow people to put us down to such a degree that we believe we have no value. You don't think I have value, but watch this, sucker. The one thing I was gonna say, did you get any of that notion from your father when you were growing up? Because my thing was like, dad, I'm gonna show my dad yeah. that I'm not a bum. Did you have anything like that at all well, about your my, father? My dad really didn't want to be bothered with me. And my stepdad is, okay. was really my dad, and they're both, God rest their soul. But my, my dad had a son in a marriage after the marriage with my mom, and so they kind of stayed tucked away themselves and I would reach out to him, but I didn't get a, it wasn't reciprocated a lot until mm. I became, after I became successful. So my stepdad was the one who poured into me. I mean, he taught me all the life lessons. Like he said, when I was young, he said, son, I said, yes, sir. He said, I see all these little pretty girls coming around here. I said, he said, you're putting a little muscle on now. Here they come. I said, yes, sir. Let me say something to you. I said, okay. And he said, the man that keeps a whole lot of women will eventually run out of money. <laughs> but the man who keeps a whole lot of money will never run out of women. Oh my goodness, that's a, that's a good one. That's a, that's, that'd be a good yeah, tattoo. Yeah, but it shifted it for me. He said, mm. see that one? If she gets pregnant, children cost this, they cost that, they cost this, they cost that. And he would break down the numbers to me. I'd be like, oh, oof. A booty's big, bro. I sure ain't trying to get locked up like that, man. You know what I mean? I appreciate a watermelon, yeah, brother, yeah, but sure. good Lord. Oh, my God. Yeah, derail your whole life, man. You wow, know. that's a that's a very deep, that's that's a good one, man. I'm glad I asked you that question. I just, I just suddenly wondered, you know, I think a lot of that comes from the parental thing, you know, and, and uh, some people well, won't admit well, you it. Know, not having my dad present, I didn't really go to war to prove anything to him. It was really all for me because the people around me were so willing to be average. I just couldn't do it, man. Couldn't. It was something burning inside me. You know, I got it. And I was always inspired from um, there was a, a, a gentleman in, the, in my neighborhood. His name was Leo is Leo Johnson. I don't know where Mr. Johnson is today, but he was an actor. He was a working man, he was a father, he was a husband, and he was a Buffalo soldier. <laughs> okay, well, that's about as real as you can get. Yeah, and so, and he played semi-pro football and he was always fit, but he took an interest in my well-being. Okay. Yeah, and 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 uh, that cat made a lot of difference for me. It's, it's just like my career, it's like going along right now. People say, I don't see you as much as I want to see you. Where are you? Some hold of the stuff me, I can't hold on, but some me. of the stuff I can't even do because like what, like what? I'm actually not into victimizing women, children, elderly people, disparaging people's race and well, no, belief man, systems I mean, and no, stuff. I ain't into all that with my art. You know no, what I'm saying? Right, right. Well, yeah. So you're saying that art can be used to do those things? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And so you mean as a character that you're offered to play, you don't want to play people who do that sort of thing? I get that. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I'll play a guy that's got some issues, got some troubles. And if he's uncool to other people, as long as he gets it in the end, then that that's art imitating life because that's the way karma goes, right? Well, you got to so, be certain. You got to be pretty confident in yourself to 
to know that you want to do that in a character that you're playing. Right. And there's going to be more to you than what's on that page. Right. And sometimes when you make it known in the beginning that you might want to do an adjustment on a role, people get scared, man. They're, I know. Oh, Jesus Christ. No, he wants to do this and he's yeah, going yeah. to do that. No, fuck that. Yeah. You know, we'll get another actor. And it's it's a touchy thing to, to you got to be brave and no, I'm not going to say it like that. Or I'm not going to do it like that. Yeah, they have to know that you that you have goodness behind your intentions. Yeah, but I'm always up front. I never get on the set and surprise somebody. No, that's, that's low down, man. I don't. And I look at other actors that do that. I go, yeah, what the hell is that's wrong been with you? done to me. Yeah, yeah. Where people get on the set and they start doing all these other things, and you go, what What are you, what are you doing? Dennis Hopper actually did that to me uh, when I the early on working with him. And he thought it was a, a a good thing. He thought it was a tricky thing, and it was an actor thing, and it was something I needed to learn <laughs> from him that I could use later. You know, was you know that sneaky shit. You know, and at the time I was wow. I thought, man, is that how they do it? You know, is is that how that's done? You know, is that what they do? And, <laughs> yeah. Of course, I realized. Wait a minute. Yeah, no, fuck that you, is man. not it. No. Let me tell you how Al Pacino works. We did Heat together. Yeah. And yeah, I fell in love with Al. Man, he's a beautiful human being. You you know who I'm talking. Oh, about. Sure. Al, yeah. yeah. Fuck you. So yeah. So Al does the work. He's on script, and then he turns to Michael Mann. He says, "Okay, give me a couple of Mr. P specials," and then. Al would go off, and that you better be listening, buddy, because he would leave your ass on the curb if he, he didn't pay attention. He did that to me, man. Yeah. And you're at you did he? I did Donnie Brasco. Right, right. So we probably both had the same <laughs> yeah, yeah. experience because yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. There was a part where I was supposed to scare him somehow, you know. And in the script, it was something really. I remember I looked at him and I was like. That ain't gonna scare you, man, if I do that. <laughs> right. And he was like, oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. And I said, well, we gotta come up with something. And I saw him go to Michael Newell, the director, and he was had a conversation with Michael. Here's what Michael Madsen could do that would scare me. But within my hearing distance, he's telling me. Right. And I'm going, wow, wow, okay, I guess I could do that. Yeah. But what a share, what a sharing yeah, son of a Absolutely, right? absolutely. He's Give so me old. that power to right. scare him for right. real right. because he knew it was necessary. Right. That's what you mean, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly, there was a, a, there's a scene in Heat where uh, Pacino and I, we go in and we shake this kid down. He does most of the talk and the kid's in a chop shop sitting on a, and uh, uh, it, it's played by an actor who uh, passed away, unfortunately, but this, that actor, was a comic actor. So take after take, the actor's doing the same thing. So his physical matching and his emotional matching is like on, it's in alignment, but we like, dude, this is, so Al gets outside and I was like, the guy, he's okay. And Al gets outside and Al says, I'm gonna slap the shit out of this guy. <laughs> and I'm looking at Al and so I'm just letting it pump me up, my character. He says, I'm gonna whack this kid. I'm gonna slap this kid. You got my back? I said, yeah, you got me? He says, he said, if he jumps up, slam his ass on the ground. I said, you got it, man. Let's go, let's roll. So we get in there and Al slapped the smoke out this actor. And he slapped his ass again. And this is a black dude. So the brother looked up at Al and he looked at me and he got ready to swell up on Al and I slammed him back down. I said, sit your motherfucking monkey ass down. <laughs> Right? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. So after the take, Al said, that was amazing. <laughs> the dude was holding his face over there. I said, oh, Al, yeah. let me know you going. He went and hugged and kissed the kid and explained. And he said, you, you're doing the same thing like you practice at home. Be free. Be open. Now the kid was scared of Al and nervous like this. <laughs> and it worked for the but scene. But it worked for the scene. It worked yeah. for the scene, yeah. We, we, we went out to a, um, a Chinese restaurant, me and him, me and Al. Early on, on here, Johnny, on LA or Bresco, New York. in New York, yeah, yeah, and I had just met him and hardly, you know, hadn't spent a lot of time around him. <laughs> he said, oh, let's go, come on, come on, come on, oh, okay, okay. So we go to this Japanese restaurant, Chinese restaurant, and uh, you know, he's sitting there, we're sitting there, 
And the waiter comes over and uh, he pours a tea, right? And uh, you know, Alice he's looking at him and he and he, he goes, Hey, hey Michael, 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 watch this, watch this. And they go, What what are you gonna do? He goes, Oh, just watch this, watch this. And they go, What what are you gonna do? He goes, oh, just watch, watch, watch. This poor kid comes over and he's got the tea. And I was like, No, 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 no. I got some. I got it. And you know the little uh flakes in the bottom when you pour the tea? Yeah. Tea leaf sediment. The tea leaf, yeah. yeah. What's that? What's that down in there? What's that? What's that? And the kid's like, uh, I don't know. And he goes, there's dirt. Put dirt in there. He goes, dirt. And he threw it on the ground. And the poor kid is like, oh, my God. <laughs> the kid huh. is going to shit himself. You gave me dirt. What is this dirt? <laughs> and he walked, the kid walks away. And I go, Jesus Christ, what are you doing to that poor fucking guy? He goes, oh, nothing. I'm just fucking around. Just, just want to, you know. <laughs> I didn't see that. I didn't see that at all. Yeah. But he was in the process of giving me his version of Sonny Black, uh, sort of. Uh, like yeah. intellectually. Right. You know, in a, in a weird way. But I didn't realize it in that moment. But that's the, sh the system of show, don't tell. Yeah, and this poor kid came yeah. back, man, later. And he was trembling and shaking like he was going to fall. And I was the nicest guy in the world to him. And actually put his arm on and said, no, nah, I'm just fucking with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i just kidding. i just, you know, just trying. The guy was obviously, you know, uh, um, confused by it. And relieved. And and relieved. Yeah. But, but, but what a, I, I know uh, it's too bad we don't get actors like that more often to yeah. work with, right? Yeah, that's right. I got these, these questions and I got to figure out All right, how cool. to get them in here without sounding like, uh, well, okay. So you play some amazing characters throughout your career. Is there one character that you feel connected to more than another that had an impact on you personally? Well, no. I don't feel more connected to one character over another. I mean, there's some characters that I think have more effect on the public than others. Um, sometimes negative effect, like 12 Angry Men. And then sometimes, you know, with the late uh, Billy Friedkin. And then there's uh, projects like Fences and Forrest Gump that would do more to inspire you. I don't think we're going to need that. Lesson. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So, so, but the answer is no, I don't really uh, care more for one character or the other because when, when, when I approach character, I really don't say that word character anymore because character is an excuse not to be real. Yeah. It can yeah. be it can be a crutch. And when I start talking about certain types of human beings, I'm talking about somebody's entire humanity, man. And mm -hmm. that's what I live out on screen is someone else's humanity. Hopefully they're flawed in a very relatable human way. But they're trying to be victorious in their journey. But that it's just it's the human condition. You know what I mean? You have to remember everybody is somebody's child, and you're gonna remind somebody of their kid when you're on screen. Do you feel like you've had a um, an, an evolution of your career? Like where your career is at now? Is it where you you imagined it would be at this point in in, in, a, in a good way or a negative way? I would say there are positives. But the answer is yes, I did expect to be in this uh, situation in my career. On a podcast with Michael Madsen. Yeah, but that's a highlight. <laughs> this is one of the highlights. But some of the other stuff are like the deals that get done behind closed doors yeah, and yeah. different things. And you can feel people's respect for or lack of respect for your instrument based on the way they negotiate with your team. And so... Uh, I tend to fall out of some negotiations because when I get to a point that I feel like someone's just, instead of dealing with the artist as a production company or studio, what have you, instead of coming to the artist and doing the, keeping the relationship, they send these business affairs attorneys, many of whom are weasels. They're weasels, man. Yeah. And yeah. 
they hurt people people with paper because they're too yeah, like, cowardly uh, to step up in somebody's face and tell them what they think oh their value God. is. I, I'm serious. I, no, so, no, I, I know yeah, you are. I, I yeah. get it. I mean, what? Right. Outside of knowing exactly what you mean, I guess a logical question would be, how do you deal with that personally, moving through that process and knowing, once you know that that process is out there, how do you start dealing with it personally to, to, to when you know you're stepping into it again? <laughs> it Well, the thing for me is, uh, I was raised in America. Mm. So my American experience and yours are two different experiences. Yeah. I yeah. know what mine is. I had an example, uh, I'll give you an example. I was uh, picking up some cheese for a friend of mine for Thanksgiving en route to his home. He said, pick up these two cheeses. I said, text me. I don't want to think about cheese. So I, I'm in line, ring, I'm at the grocery store. I answer, hey, what's up, man? You need something else? He says, no, where are you? I said, I'm next in line. He says, what are the cheeses about, 11, 12 bucks? I said, yeah, about that. He said, well, just put a 20 on the counter and walk out. I said, you done lost your damn mind. A black man is going to walk out of a store with merchandise and no receipt. Yeah. But he wasn't trying to be funny, but right, that was right. his experience. Yeah, no, I get you. Yeah, yeah. So, so in Hollywood, it's the same thing. We are constantly reminded who we all are. Well, to the I, powers that be. I, I think one of the best examples of that is that just came in my head was, you know, the, the whole question of racism, you know. And and the white person, the white person will say, or the uh, common white response is, you know, I'm some of my best friends are people of color. Even though the saying of that is exactly <laughs> representative of <laughs> right. so fucked up, right? Right, 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 right. So <laughs> <laughs> No, it's true, man, but everybody oh. they don't have their lenses on. They can't see what you see, man. You're a brave uh, cat, and I always say one of the things I loved working love about working with you was you were you were brave, man. And and uh yeah, I was young and I was producing that thing and and uh you know, I had certain ideas of, of things, but um, it was really the role that you had was so important to me because to me it was it was the the part of the story that was being over dramatized in the writing of it. And but it meant enough to me that I wanted to make sure it was covered completely honestly. And I could just say just about anything to you, man. Yeah. And you never lost it. You never for a second no. ever took a minute to say, what the fuck, Michael? You just went with it. And, and it made me, you know, we were partners. We were police cop partners. And, and, and you taught me in reality what it would be like to have a partner in, in a, an officer related uh, relationship yeah in a cop thing with another yeah. man yeah 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 you know and i never wow i didn't expect that to happen yeah it became organic you know well th that that's because you and i gave birth to those characters those human beings you feel me and yeah. so we brought a little bit of our respect when you look at another man that you respect it's really difficult to go into a world where you hate that person you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we didn't have that kind of work ahead of us. And I think it transcended the the screen. You know, the relationship that our characters had. That picture's called Vice, by the way, yeah. for anyone who has never seen it. Yeah. Well, Vice. Me and Mikey here and yeah. Daryl Hannah. And yeah. Years ago in Vancouver, but uh, it's a personal favorite of mine. And yeah. I love Michael T. in the movie. Yeah. And... <laughs> I thought I'd bring it up. I don't know. It's a I appreciate good picture, that. It's a mysterious uh, picture to me. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. What part do you think, um, like when you're in your everyday life and you're walking down the street or you're driving down the street or you sit down somewhere, what do you feel is, what do you find is the role that you have played that you feel like you're the most recognized for on the street, you know, by the common person? It's all conducive to age, group, and gender. Uh, 
if someone walks by or yells out of a car, ATL, I know that there's a certain age group that saw me in the movie ATL and liked that Uncle George character. Then people will give me, they'll yell out something from Forrest Gump, Bubba Blue, something. Yeah. And um, and so on and so forth, you know. And uh, uh, it kind of tells me where they connected with me in time. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, so it yeah, establishes yeah, yeah. a history with myself and that person right away. They've established a history because they saw me in that thing, you know? What do you think is 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 now the one that you're most connected to, most often role that you've done? There's three. And they're all about equal. Uh, obviously, at the top, or first I'll put down Forrest Gump, the Bubba Blue role from that. Then I'll put down fences, you know, and uh, gave, playing Gabriel Maxson, you know, Denzel's brother's uh, son, uh, Denzel's, Denzel, Denzel's brother character. And and then there's um, Waiting to Exhale, which women love. They go crazy for that movie, man. I apologize. I've not seen that one. It's okay. And, and I'll also add that Chicago PD has a lot of fans. They have a massive fan base. And I did an arc on that show, season five, that people really liked. They loved to hate my character and they would love to see me back. But those are about the four. Do you enjoy directing more than acting? It's a different kind of joy. Um, acting is my first love. But I also love writing. I love, uh, I'm a musician, so I love to play. But I would say my greatest love, if I had the choice to do only one, that would be directing. Oh, that's interesting as hell. What, um, what did you take away from Denzel when you guys did that? There's a, a, a level of professionalism yeah. that Denzel has that yeah, reminded yeah, yeah. me of the old school, the guys okay. that taught me. You know, the okay. Cleavon Littles and the Moses Guns and the Scatman Crothers and all those guys who taught me, Oh man, you know. And uh, Roscoe Lee Brown and Glenn Termins and all my teachers, you know. And so Denzel still operates from a very professional, focused position. He doesn't small talk. He's not messing around on the set. He may lighten a moment for a moment, but then he's just, he's really wanting to get the work done. And he's not like stern. He's just in it. And you can't miss the fact that that brother's in it, man. I, I did uh, an episode of, of St. Elsewhere with Denzel. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I had been just off the the train from Chicago, you know. And I, was, <laughs> I didn't know fuck all, man. Yeah. And he was the lead of that show, man. He was a doctor. Yeah. Him and a guy named David Morris. Yeah. They were the two lead doctors of St. Elsewhere, you know. And, and uh, I was the... Um, I was like the uh, the bully brother, like uh, my younger brother was in the hospital from being beat up by our dad, and uh, we didn't want the hospital to find out that it was my father who beat him, who beat his ass. Right. So we try to create a racial reason, you know, why he got beat up, and yeah. so we made up this fucking lie that he was beat up, you know, racially, and. Uh, and I remember I thought I was the shit, man. I had my, I had this brown leather jacket, you know, that I thought was super cool. And the, the zipper was broke, but I dug it because the collar was <laughs> up and shit. And I was all cool, you know, and I came in. And I'm like, you know, my father was, uh, you know, uh, we love our father and, you know, that shit. And here comes Denzel. And he, he today he's, that's him. But at that time, he was the guy in the TV show, but he was way beyond me. You know, uh, on that moment, that's for sure. And uh, I was watching him, and uh, he has to enter the room when I'm talking to my brother, when we're cooking up our little plan. Mm. And I'm supposed to say the N word, right? And it's supposed to be the first time on television that an actor is going to say this shit. And I'm like, oh my God, you know. So I'm telling my brother, listen, here's what we're going to do we're going to say the name. And right when I'm about to say this, Denzel comes in, right? 
<laughs> Smart. So you can imagine. So Smart. here we are in the in the in the rehearsal, and I'm like, see, I'm like, just gonna tell these people my that that this was done by the and there's Denzel staring at me. And Jesus Christ, you know, I was blown back by the honesty of his his presence in the moment. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. nothing to do with acting. You know, it, it was a reality. And it hit me so hard, like, wow, Michael, wake up, you fool. You know, and uh, so we did it, and then uh, like around lunchtime, he was wandering around, and I said, "Hey, man, I go, um, what, what do you, what do you, how did you do that?" And he looked at me and he goes, well, "Do what?" And I said, "Well, you know, when you come in like that, you really got me." And I don't know, man. It really, it was, I don't know what, what, what are you, what are you using? And he, and he, he goes, "Fear." And it was just me and him alone, you know. And I said, "Fear," and he goes, "Yeah." I said, fear of what? And he goes, of that. Meaning fear of fear. Yeah. What a gigantic thing to say. Right. Holy Jesus Christ, you know? I never forgot that. Yeah, yeah. I never forgot that. What a tremendous, uh, you ain't gotta get taught that in acting school, you know? Well, it can develop in acting school, but you know, I, t to Denzel's credit, his wife, is that pure as an actor? His daughter, Olivia, is that pure? His son, uh, John David, is that pure? And his son, other son, Malcolm, as a director, is that pure? That family's royalty, man. You no, know, the, 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 the brevity of that, of, yeah. of saying that, yeah. the honesty of that just blew me down. I always wish years later we had found something to do together. We never did. I don't know. One of these days, maybe someday. Yeah, you'll I find sure, it. I sure would like to. Yeah. What role haven't you played uh, so far that you're still hoping will, will come around for your career for you? Um, just a different kind of human being. I played all the different kinds of human beings I've already lived through, but just something different. Um, and every opportunity presents something different because the script is different, surrounded by different cast. So I make different choices. And that, that becomes the challenge, is to go from one movie and not do the same thing you did in that movie, for me as a character actor, and do some. But if you're like a Tom Cruise or a Michael Madsen or a cool guy or DiCaprio, you can do this, man. There's certain things people want to see you do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Eddie Murphy, for example. They want to hear that laughter and the things that distinguish him from other people, and they want to see that stuff in you guys as leading men, too. Do you, do you find that that sort of definition of an actor has held you back ever or prevented you no, from doing something? I've, no, I've always wanted to be uh, a, a character actor um, because I was taught young that the character actor's career takes off like a jet. When a leading man, there's too many outside forces, that, because nobody does this by themselves, none of us, but there are too many outside forces that when a leading man goes up, could, be, could make all these mistakes or be enticed by trying to get them three, four leading men, leading women, and then they start to fall off with the help that they're giving that one person. Yeah. That they, it's, it's like, for example, Tom. No, 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 that's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so, but for me as a character actor, I expect it to always work because that's what my teachers were teaching me, and I believed it. There have been things that, that I did that I thought were so much better than the things that are typically expected of me. Right, right. And, and those are not the things that anybody remembers. And those are not the ones that got all the attention. You know, is that what I meant is like, once you get uh, stereotyped or once you get, we like to see him be that guy. Mm -hmm. Once that starts to happen, 
don't you think in the beginning it's really rewarding? You say, well, thank God I got that. But then later on, um, was it your experience that you would think, man, you know, I've done some other things and they're never going to be thought of as fondly as the typical cigarette gunfire person thing. And and then going back to the guys who are controlling shit, yeah, yeah. you realize that other people have a say-so about what you might be able to be seen in. And those fuckers, you know, all be whatever they're dreaming of, they don't want you to move out of this certain thing. Right. I played a boxer. I played an Irish American prize fighter in a picture. And uh, I thought it was pretty damn good. I mean, I thought, oh man, this is my thing. I, yeah. I've arrived as an actor, you know, this yeah. it doesn't get better than that. And it was in a certain place where it was gonna get distribution and this and that. Nice. But it didn't happen. And the picture basically just disappeared. And when I got in touch with the distribution end of that area of the industry, a couple years later, I found out that they had purposely not wanted to back me in that role. The one guy said to me, well, we're not gonna bet against ourselves, he said to me. Meaning, Matson is a surefire, we give him a cigarette and a, and a pistol, that he's gonna put somebody down or smack somebody or he's gonna do this or that, that's gonna work. And we gotta keep getting him for that. And if we support him in this other kind of part, he's a father, he's not smoking, he's a, a, a prize fighter, he's fighting for the life of his son. My God, you know, no, 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 no. They weren't gonna back me for that. And I'm, and I'm wondering, I know that you know what I mean. And so have you encountered that in any role that you thought was outstanding in a way that you were purposely buried in it? Um, I, Kiefer Sutherland, uh, whom I love, you know, Kiefer's a good dude, man. Yeah, no, He's sure. A beautiful you know, cat. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, Kiefer asked me to do this project that uh, Brad Merman had screenwritten called mm -hmm. Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Okay. Martin Sheen came and did a cameo for us. I mean, it was loaded with talent. Kevin Pollack, uh, it was just a bunch of us, right? And when that movie came out, was about to be released, the executive, the head of the studio, there was a changing of the guard. Mm -hmm. So the executive that supported our movie and had it teed up for wide distribution left and the mm -hmm. new executive came in and as i understand it from my observation you don't see executives promote a former executives material you just don't <laughs> right no, they, they just they just yeah they just don't want that thing to be big uh, and they had no it's not part of their dna that's what i meant yeah 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 Here, here's another thing i went through man i was uh, on a television series it was a third in the lineup, the eight o'clock slot, right? Tuesday nights, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, and we were a 10 o'clock show. And uh, the network was winning every week. It was crushing people. So we get moved to Friday, lost the audience. The show they put in its spot, the audience didn't buy, and they started looking elsewhere instead of this network, and the, all everybody's ratings fell off. Then they moved us to Sunday. That didn't work, and eventually we got canceled. The hottest show on the network in the 10 o'clock slot, winning this slot every week. A few months later, I'm at that network, and I'm walking down the uh, walkway upstairs, and then a woman comes out of her office, behind her door was open, and she saw me pass by. She ran out, Michael T, and I turned around. It was this casting person, I won't say her name. But she said, how are you? She said, I'm so happy you came in for this. You're right for this. And I'm really sorry about that. And she named the show that I was on. She said, oh, did you hear how the show got canceled? I said, no. She said, come into my office. We walk in. She said, close the door. I closed the door. 
And then she said, the executive in charge of the Friday night 10 o'clock slot and the executive in charge of your Tuesday night 10 o'clock slot played a round of golf and bet your show's time slot. That's how you got moved to Friday. You got lost again. We moved you to Sunday thinking, and the whole night fell apart. She said, I'm glad you're here. She said, but I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's what happened to your show. Our career is being decided by a couple of guys on the golf course. Yeah, there you go. There you go, Mike. There you go. <laughs> so there that you sums go, it up, man. I, I did a show, I did a, a series once for a big network uh, many years ago. And uh, it was doing, I thought it was doing very well. It was number three in a lineup for that network that year. And we had did 16 episodes and it went, it was over. They pulled it. And I found out later that the executive producer's wife didn't like the show. Yeah, yeah. She didn't understand it. And she would tell the husband, I don't get this thing. Why are you doing this with these actors? And I don't like the show. And that was determined to be one of the reasons why he didn't want to do it anymore. You know, it's, uh, I think of the average person uh, the average uh, watcher of entertainment, yeah. whatever that is, knew some of these things. What would they think? I mean, because uh, it ain't the magical, magicianal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thing that we think it is right, right, right. at all. It's a lot of work. When you yeah. got people on a golf course and people's wives telling them what the fuck they we should be watching, man, that was what I was trying to get at. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. Well, how do you see yourself going forward knowing the shit that we just talked about you just keep going you just keep going because your vibe is your tribe eventually you'll find the kind of people that you should be rolling with anyway and i always do you know and so you know it's like jumping from lily pad to lily pad you know you put your pinky toe on the next lily pad and it starts to sink you go nah that's not my lily pad you what do wait. you think of casting directors as as opposed to uh, just meeting a director and you can skip all that stuff or or just being contacted by somebody who's going to make something and they say listen man we want you to do this thing don't you I find it to be a lot more fulfilling emotionally yeah. when you don't have to dance on the table to get something listen I agree with that wholeheartedly um, we talked a little bit about negotiations earlier it's like the faster someone does a deal, if a director like a, the late Billy Friedkin reaches out for me directly to tell me he wants me to be in 12 Angry Men, Men Michael Mann, Heat, and it just go Forrest Whitaker, Waiting to X, and it just keeps going. When the directors and the filmmakers and the producers reach out to you directly, there's something about actors, there's a joy and a light bulb in the respect department that turns on yeah. And you cannot stop us from shining because we feel so respected. We feel so appreciated. We don't feel hammered down by some business affairs, affairs attorney. And you wanted us to be part of this process. And it's different when you walk on the set, right? Yeah. Because you know, hey, man, I'm wanted here. Right. I don't have to prove anything. I'm not here to prove a goddamn thing. Right. I was asked to be here. Yeah, yeah. By the, by the proper proper person to be asking me god damn it and yeah. here i'm gonna do my thing yeah you feel so much more better about it right i i do i i actually want to prove how right my friend was you know like when you invited <laughs> me to come work with you i said yeah, yeah. yeah i said yeah. hell yeah i'm about to show out man i'm about to crush this damn thing. oh man when i see clips of us even from like free willy yeah yeah you know, man, uh, you know, we, we both started out in the same headspace or the same desire, I think, of, of what we were going to do or what we were doing. And when you see us on film yeah. that long ago, it's wonderful. There's something wonderful about it. <laughs> it's magical, brother. You know? I loved it. And we made it, man. You yeah, know? we did. We're sitting here talking to each other in an office on Melrose and, you know, God damn it, you can't. Nobody can take that away from you. Nobody right. can take that away from us. That's exactly right. Because that's legacy, my brother. That's legacy. You know, you mentioned, you asked me if I think the casting, I, I understood your question to also include behind your question, 
if one is better over the other, a casting director or a producer. It, I think casting directors are amazing yeah. because when I work as a director, I don't have time to look through 20 guys to get come up with the top four or five. Yeah. And so if there's someone I have in mind, I'll put them in that four or five and casting knows it, but then you always have to back yourself up as a yeah. casting person in case Michael Madsen is not available, what's yeah. my next choice? So it's a very, casting people are amazing. They get us. Well, and, sometimes. And, yeah, yeah, and they're very important, as you well know, very important part of that component. You know? In the beginning though, don't you think, more so in the very beginning, when you're young and you're trying to make it and you have a certain idea of what the industry is and you th I'm gonna meet the casting director and this is how it's done. Yeah, yeah. Years later, if you're lucky enough to have survived long enough to have your work speaking for itself, you, you, you're you able to have the privilege of skipping that part of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, out of respect. Right. Not losing respect for casting people or what they do. Right. But you no longer need to have that presentation of you. Guys like us, we have a body of work that people can refer to. Mm -hmm. But still, there are times when you may be directing something. And uh, I'll use Denzel as an example. When we were doing Fences uh, on Broadway, everybody loves Denzel. D is just cool with everybody. But how can he just pick one or two actors and say, no, he had to see everybody so no one's feelings were hurt. So he had to deal with that part of it too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because you don't want to alienate people and go, what, I did that play full film. Oh, it's you know? such a personal yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. man. So, but that's oh. the way, that's the way it has to be done at well, a certain level. When people love and adore you, you can't start. Well, you know. you're gonna, you know, put it in the category of Denzel. Obviously, you're also referring to his own personal intelligence and, and respect for him yeah. knowing that. And integrity. But you're not gonna get that from 75% right. of the casting process that, that happens to an actor right, at the true. beginning of your career, man. Yeah, 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 that's true. I mean, wow, I mean, I'm sure you, you, you like, I'm sure we went through similar experiences in, in that, you know, casting director atmosphere. Right. And I'm pumping gas in Beverly Hills and I was going in to read for Miami Vice or or Cagney and Lacey or something. Right, you know? right. And I just figured, you know, that's the way that you do it, you know. And 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 I had gone to one meeting uh, and I was on my way to the pump gas. So I had my blues on with my sh mic on my shirt. Right. You know, and I was on a motorcycle. And I went to MGM, you know, and I went in this office, holy Christ, man. You know, and they were making this little, you know, camcorder thing of right. me. And, you know, I was all like, wow, you know, uh, I was thinking I'm late for work and, and I'm reading this copy and stuff and, oh, you know, and I got the part like two days later, but they said to my agent, you know, we just wanted to let you know that we thought Michael was a fucking genius for showing up dressed like a blue collar guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I was, oh my God, you know? He's a genius. And he's a fuck, I'm a fucking genius. <laughs> I went to Western Costume, I got a, <laughs> give me a, a gas pumper's uniform because I'm gonna wear it to the audition. Many years later, <laughs> <laughs> many, many years later, right. I refused to go to casting directors because I thought that I had arrived. And oh, so, yeah, yeah. You know, did a couple of movies and some big stuff and I thought, yeah, you know, I don't have to do that anymore. And I went for a reading for a, a picture, the cowboy film, with a very uh, big name actor uh, and uh, uh, a big A-lister in a big studio. Right. And I was to be his brother in the story. And uh, I went in and I didn't want to do it because it was casting director. And she videoed me, you know, and I, uh, I did my interpretation of what I thought the brother, and it's a historical film, so it was certain truth based in there somewhere right. and I was doing what I thought the brother would most likely have been considering who the lead actor was at the same time right. and I remember she stopped me and she said no 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 I don't I'm not, or even recall her name honestly but she was a well-respected casting director and she said um, 
Michael, no, you're you're just you're, you know, you're you're really you're you're taking it. You know, you're you're, it's too much. Mm. You know, you got to remember this movie's not about you. It's not about your character. Mm. And I and I realized that I took what she said the wrong way to a certain degree, but also I th I took it as encouragement to do something different. And I was like, well, okay, what do you mean? And she said, you really got to underplay it. Just really bring it down, Michael. Just you know, be almost just, you know, compassionate, uh, discompassionate, you know. And I said, wow, well, you know, is, is that what they're looking for? And she goes, yes, in this situation. And so I did it again. I did it a couple more times, and I did it way, 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 way down, you know, just, uh, you know, almost uh, just nonplussed, you know. And anyway, I didn't get the part. Mm -hmm. uh, it went to another actor. A good actor, a great actor, and I obviously didn't do the film, but I never forgot about that. And about three years later, uh, a friend of mine said to me, "Remember when you read for so and so?" And I was like, uh, "Yeah, I do remember that." He goes, "Wow, you know, there was some people sitting next to us in the restaurant, and they were talking about you." And I said, "Oh no, really?" And it was the director of that movie. And I said, what did he say? What did he say? And she goes, well, well, he said, you know, that he had read Mike Matz. He, had, he saw Michael Madsen's video and that he had been depressed because he had thought Michael was going to bring something more to it. And he didn't want to give him the role because Michael had been so kind of, you know, so not no non-energy wow. in, in the audition. And they were having this but conversation. you were following direction. I was following directions. Right. So that's what I was trying to get at with the casting for a young actor coming up, which right. I would imagine you being on the show, there's going to be a lot of younger guys, younger talent that are going to, what the hell's Michael T have to say? Right. And they respect you. And uh, what advice would you give to a young actor on how to deal with the casting process, considering the fact that you and I know that that certain thing can happen and you could be changed by another person right. like that. Right. What are we going to do? Yeah. You know, that that's a tough one because as a young actor, you're usually not in the position to speak up. <laughs> right. You right, know? Right, right, and right. And so, you know, you win some, you lose some. That's just kind of yeah. it's unfortunate. But, but my advice to the actor would be, First thing I tell all actors is save your money. And then my advice on the acting side is uh, don't take it personally. You will misdirect it. There you go. And you don't, yeah. And there then you, you just, you just you keep go. it moving. Yeah. the origin of your name, Michael T. I, I've Michael, never heard anybody in my whole life named Michael T before. Yeah, Michael T is a, a Native American name. It uh, It's from not the Blackfoot tribe, but its origin is from Blackfeet tribe. Okay. Uh, and uh, it means silent friend or uh, spirit like God. That's what that's what it means. But, you know, that's a lot to live up to, man. It, that, no, that's a big tag, man. That's, <laughs> that's a, a lot one. to live up that's to, brother. That's a big tag. Be nice if you were referred to as that, but to be referenced like that, wow. Yeah. Have you found that, that um, you are that, by the way, though. Do, do you find it a burden to live up to that definition? No. I think if I just do what I know is the right thing to do and live so I can look at my face in the mirror, and my kids aren't ashamed, my wife ain't ashamed, my family, my friends but, but are not ashamed is, of me, though, see? then I'm good. But there it is, though. See, so you you are the embodied definition of who you just described that your name it, it well, means. <laughs> let, me, let me explain. This is this is how, 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 not religiously, but this is how I see God. The ocean, and we are just a drop from a thimble Mm -hmm. in that ocean. Mm -hmm. If we're honest with ourselves, we know that where we live right now is the ocean. 
And we have to kind of dissolve into this God consciousness and be the best dudes you can possibly be, or best dang you can possibly be in your journey. The one you can possibly be. I didn't say you won't make mistakes. I didn't say there won't be times of desperation along that journey because there have been for all of us. But find your way out of that, to back to being the best person, you, the best version of you possible. That's a pretty brave uh, thing to say. I'd like to believe, you know, in my finest hour that I'm, I feel exactly the same way. Do you find it difficult to live up to that own, your own definition of what you want yourself to be defined as? Like, no. as, as far as yeah. we're up against a lot of shit, man. Yeah. You but, know? Yeah, I understand. But I don't, I don't let it, I don't, I'm not influenced by it. I see it and I, there's a lot of stuff that puzzles me, man. Every day, you might think I'm a pretty bright fella, but there's some stuff I don't know. And I, I, I I see on the street, yeah, you know, out there, you know, yeah, arrogance and 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 hostility and 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 insincere friendliness, yeah, and, and just like like a lit fuse, you know, is yeah. going and 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 then I wonder, you know, has it always been that way, man, or or or, or is it just? Are we older now and I'm seeing it that way? Well, there was a time when people had shame. Okay. Okay. You know what I'm talking about. Exactly. I know exactly if, what you're talking about. Man, if I do that and get caught, my wonderful family. Wonderful thing to say, man. God, Mike. If I do that, if I steal that, my family, I get caught, my family, we had shame. Oh. But. And conscience. And conscience. Yeah, conscience. Yeah. But. What's wrong with the country today is our leaders are too mean-spirited. They don't exhibit the level of class that should rub off on us. They're mean, and they have transferred that mean spirit in this social experiment, because this is a social experiment, America. Yeah. But in this experiment, with the social engineers that work for our government, they should we should have a much more conducive society to harmony. But we don't because these social engineers find it profitable to divide and and profit, and that's what they're doing. To me it's troubling thought that that um it's 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 a the buy sell buy mentality. Because you're absolutely right. Right. Isn't a certain degree of that what created a world where we can have art and we can have what we do. And at the same time, it's created this whole other hell of 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 lying and deceit and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and all that other shit. So yeah. where do you draw the line personally in, in dividing those two kind of thoughts of, of, of thinking? Well, I, I minimize the amount of uh, social media that uh, okay, that I allow into my life, you know, I control it. I don't let so much of it in that it starts controlling me, you know, because now what you're responsible for all these millions of followers. I don't even want that. I don't want to talk to somebody every day. I just don't. I'm just not interested, man. And so I minimize my exposure to social media, to so-called news. So and, yeah, because you and I both know that if it's on the radio, you hear it, that's programming. If it's on television, you see it and you hear it, that's programming. Mm -hmm. If it's in a magazine, you can read it, that's programming. And that's yeah. what we do. The word entertain, it's origin. I remember when I was a young guy and I learned the origin of the word entertain. It means to enter and hold captive. Now see, if you contain something, it's held captive. If you retain an attorney, they're held captive. If you obtain, it's held captive. Entertain is to enter and hold captive. But when you do that, you have a tremendous responsibility, man. It ain't just about the damn check. That's stupid as hell. It's power, man. It's a big power. Yeah, it's a lot of power Privilege, associated man. with it. Yeah, I live in a very regular house because there's certain things that I won't do because I know what it is. I know how it's going to affect kids. I know how it's going to affect 
anyone who watches it, the programming that's gonna go down. That's why I don't mess with a lot of stuff, man. I just I don't fool with it, brother. Well, what do you think is the best advice for, uh, in the parental way? You know, we're both fathers. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm troubled by, you know, how to deal with my sons. Yeah, yeah. Or um, uh, children that I've been a part of creating outside of the fact that it was a different generation and this and that and this and that. What do you think would be your best advice for parental, any kind of stability parentally now in your life of this, where we're at in this, in this world? Um, my advice is just, just keep loving your way through it. If you do something, if your kid does something and it infuriates you so much that you want to just let them have it, ah, you! <laughs> Squash that nonsense, dude. <laughs> Go for a walk. Do something. Because when you walk, have a little oxygen extraction, you're going to come back a different kind of cat. I respected my father, though, because I was scared of him. Yeah, yeah. I understand. There's something to that. And I, I don't, I'm not advocating it. Right, right. I'm just saying um, to taking a walk is a better idea. Yeah. But if my dad had taken a walk, a lot of times, things that I was doing might have just been ignored. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know where I would have ended up. And so, yeah. is it because it was better for that generation to not take a walk? Or is it dangerous for us now to think that we should take a walk instead of reacting? I think it's it's a little bit of both. It's, um, you don't want to... You and I, we don't, we don't want to intimidate our kids so much that they like they're terrified of us. But with my stepdad, he taught hand-to-hand -hand combat in the Air Force, right? My brother taught it in the Army. And so he taught us how to scrap when we were little, right? And he told us, never let anybody disrespect your martial art. Now, I saw him do things that I realized, woo, I never want to run up on my dad like, some cocky little punk because yeah, I know yeah. what could happen to me. Yeah. But that was an innate respect and reverence and fear of I'm going to run into those big fists if I get too too big because he would glove, my dad would glove you up. So where do you draw the line between love and respect as far in the as far as fear goes? You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. if I respected my father because I was afraid of him I still, my God, I love him. I loved him, but um, like, what do you think of masculate, ma the masculine man, masculine men? I mean, to be demasculated, don't you think that men have become demasculated? Yeah, I do. I don't think it's okay. It really bugs me. It, well, it's not appealing to me. When I see a, a manly man, that's respectful and appealing to me. If I see a softer man, then I might have to protect this dude. And that yeah. just looks like work to me. <laughs> so I try not to roll with dudes who are too soft because- No, that's cool. No, I'm just no, saying. It's, yeah, it's like, sure. yeah, I don't want us in trouble. You know, I roll with some cats that, uh, I roll hard with cats that are like you and me. I, I wanted to project to my sons uh, that, that idea of nobody's gonna fuck with your dad okay and from them to learn wow man yeah my dad yeah you know he he wasn't gonna take shit but then finding out later in life it was a certain part of that they might not have really needed to that level and how much of it was i only projecting what i had been taught right. into their minds when they didn't they look at me like, damn, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? But you and I, we're from a different time. And, and we have to accept that all the valuable lessons, the drive and the ambition and the respect for self and the respect for other men and women, that is something that came to us through our journey. Right yeah. now, my children, they have a completely different journey. I have a 30-year-old. She gets both sides. She gets this new business, and she also gets the old school business. And she prefers the old school business, and she's 30. You know, she's half my age. So, oh, that's a blessing, man, for yeah, sure. You know, yeah, I, I, yeah. 
I think we got a tough time as dads these days. Do you think so? I agree. First of all, it, there seems to be uh, a programming that's out there that wants to soften all of our edges. And people, when people want you to change, want to force you into changing, they start calling you names, yeah. right? So people start calling you, making up names for you, you know, uh, because you like who you are. You're cool with anybody being who they are, but just don't pour it in my cup. I just want this, just keep mine regular. Don't make mine fancy, you know. Keep my, I want to keep my life regular. And I got, I got love for everybody. Here's, here's the way I learned how to love my enemies. The revelation came to me that some people I love close to me, like you and a bunch of my other friends and family. I love all you guys close to me, as close as I can get you. Yeah. And then there's other people, I love them as far the hell away from me as I can get them. <laughs> because... No, but yeah. seriously, yeah. because the further they go, the more I'm able to love and pray for people like that. But if they're up in your business and your cheese harming you, it's hard to get to a place of love. That's why you, we got to give people the gift of distance, brother. Bye. No, keep going. Keep going, dude. Yeah, yeah. Walk yeah. on by, yeah. Yeah, but that's how you do it. That's how you walk in love. What do you think about violence in movies, violence in film? I think it's entertaining. Yeah, and agree. I think it's just movies. I agree, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just movies. And uh, there used to be, the way our movies were made, the person that initiated all the violence was not the hero. That's why it was less harmful. But now you've got anti-heroes. You've got violent people that audiences have a lot of, not understanding, but compassion because it's it's been written that way. Well, you can understand a villain. Exactly, yeah. But you but when you start sh letting people have compassion for a rapist or a mass shooter or well, something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, that's that's, fucked that's up. a whole other sick kind of stuff. No, I prefer thing, watching right? Denzel as an equalizer. Right. You know, that makes sense to me. Yeah, man. And if you look at the old John Wayne pictures or the old big uh big studio pictures um even when there was the Cowboys against the Indians, most of the time the lead actors of those pictures were the ones that somehow had a little compassion for the Indians. Yeah, yeah. The, all the other guys could could call them the right. terrible Whatever. things and, Just, and chop yeah. their heads off and, right. and shoot them off their horses. Right. And the main dude was always like, well, you know, you know, we got to have some understanding for these folks. <laughs> all of a sudden they turn into Daniel Boone, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and you go, oh, wait a minute. So it would seem like the powers that were making those pictures wanted to not bury themselves so deep that they had the lead person be the understanding cat of, of these other nations and other things. Right. And it was very purposely done. And the secondary, the, the supporting actors would have to be the ones that would did all the bad things and said all the bad things. Right. And and I always liked antihero me. Yeah, yeah. I could completely relate to the antihero. Yeah. And I think more now than ever, it's yeah. become really attractive. Yeah. Well, when when I say antihero, technically, I don't mean the hero, but just now has to take retribution on behalf of victims. Yeah. That's yeah. that's still a hero. That's not an anti-hero to me. That's so, still a straight up hero, like Denzel and Equalizer. You know, that that's a hero, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Jason, to that. yeah but Jason Begay and Chicago PD, you know, Jason is uh he's that guy when he goes, Yeah, well, we'll take care of it. No, you know sure. it's gonna get taken care of. No, I I I, yeah. I I'm very comfortable with a role like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love watching actors who can do that. Yeah. Because there's a lot of them that can't do that. Right. And they try to do it and it doesn't work. Right. Some of the big A-listers, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you know, there was a few of them that could do that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you believe them when they did it. But um, it's become a rarity, I think, in in the the talent of, of portraying that, don't you think? I do. Well, 
like I talked about earlier, people calling us names, like they, if you're masculine, they start calling it toxic masculinity. Masculinity is not toxic. No. If it's toxic, that's some whole other stuff, man. Oh. Because a, a guy who's masculine, we there's a code, there's a man code, and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, we have a code, man. And if the people don't know what I'm talking about, it's none of your business, period. But well, we have a it man code. Need to be, really, you it, know? Yeah, it, no. It's a challenge in a weird way. Yeah. You're fascinating to me as, <laughs> as an actor and a, and a, and a person. Um, what was your favorite film of all time when you were growing up? Like, what actor said, man, that, that fucking guy's got the shit, man? What film? Like, I what would actor say, in what movie? Well, because like, we it, all got one of them somewhere, right? Yeah. I mean, but, but for me, it was, it was, it was Sidney Poitier. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, man. Of course. Anything Sydney did, oh, I was like, on. "Come on, man!" That's, they put that's him the mark. In the defiant ones with with Tony, right? You know, the, the the I mean, the two most opposite personalities <laughs> you can imagine in the film industry. Right. They right. handcuffed them together, right? <laughs> wow, right? What an incredible picture! Yeah, that is. absolutely. Okay, way ahead of its time. Yeah, way, way ahead, but timely. None the same. Ahead of ahead of their time, but also timely. Yeah, I was inspired by Sidney Poitier, man. I, I um, am so privileged to say that I had the opportunity of getting to know him. That's and, lucky, man. And, and travel I, with him, and you know. Wow. And so wow, yeah. That's so uh, yeah. geez, I mean, have you written a book yet about yourself? I have not. I have notes, but I haven't written a book yet. I think you should consider it. You know? <laughs> Anybody who has your kind of memories and that kind of ideas, I mean, yeah, you got to do that, man. You, you really, you should. Yeah. What role that you have already done are you most proud of? I would say Gabriel Maxson, Fences. I would say okay. that's one of the ultimate roles uh, in my career. So, like, if you were, if you're gone from the world. Yeah. And somebody said, okay, what, what is the quintessential Michael T. movie? Yeah, Fences. Okay, all right. Yeah. This is your show, and you're my guest, and, and, and I'm blessed to have you. So before we go, if we're going to go, what in, if there's anything in the whole world you wanted to say or talk about or mention, what, what, what is it? What would it be? I would say to uh, to anyone listening or watching to keep the faith. Keep the faith. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on other people. Give them the gift of distance, and then you'll figure out what the rest of your journey is. You got to cut some people loose, you know, uh, and lighten your load, and then you can fly, you know. Um, when I learned to fly airplanes, there's four principles to flight. There's weight thrust, lift, and drag, right? Everybody's carrying some kind of weight, but you gotta get your ass in gear and thrust. You dig? Because that weight will try to pull you down, but you also have another uh, opponent, and it's called drag. And there's people that try to drag you behind down, man. You know how it is. Yeah. So there's weight, there's thrust, there's lift, there's drag, and then there's lift. The harder you thrust and change your ailerons, it's called the attitude of the airplane. That's where the term, your attitude determines your altitude. That's where it comes from, from aviation. So when you adjust your ailerons and you start having lift, you'll overcome the weight and the drag because you got too much thrust and too much lift. Can, can I thank you for coming? But thank you. I thank appreciate you this for, invitation. For being on the show. And, uh, yeah, thank you. You know, this this whole thing's being resurrected because I tried to make this happen back before the pandemic and it all fell apart. Right, right. So you're my first guy that, that stepped up and uh, made it for real now what, 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 what it's doing. I love you, Michael. <laughs> you know it. I know you love me too, so. Stop crying, man. I hope you come back. <laughs> I hope you come back. All right, okay. Come back all right. Bye, everybody. Adios. Adios.